Welcome to Enemy of the Surveillance State, where we discuss news, tips, and open source tools to help you protect your privacy in an age of mass digital surveillance. I am your host, C. Mitchell Shaw, and joining me again today, super excited to have him back, Todd Weaver from Purism. We're going to be discussing updates to the Librem 5 phone and a brand new AWSIM, and no, I didn't say that wrong, it's AWSIM mobile plan offered by Purism to go hand in hand with the Librem phone to better protect your privacy. We're going to be discussing that and much more this week on Enemy of the Surveillance State. Well, Todd, before we do anything else, brother, welcome back to the show, man. It's always a thrill to have you on. Oh, no, thanks. Uh, thanks so much for having me back. So uh, for my listeners, you may remember that I've had Todd on a couple times in the past. Uh, the last time I think was, gosh, it was probably four months ago. Uh, and we talked about the Librem 5 uh, phone and some other things that are going on with with Purism. They make laptops and uh, and uh, the, the coolest thing in, in my thing is the Librem key, uh, you know, just look it up guys. It's the coolest thing in the world. You plug this in to uh, a Librem laptop and it, it will tell you whether anybody has been messing with your junk while you were out of the room. Uh, it's just pretty cool. So you got to go through airport security or something like that. It, you know, if you're like me, if I go through airport security and they take my laptop away from me for more than 30 seconds, I never boot it again. Uh, I just assume that they've, they've pwned me and I will strip it for parts, sell them on eBay and go buy myself another laptop uh, with the Librem key that's not the case. So that's super cool. Uh, their laptops are super cool. And the Librem five, which has been sort of in, in sort of growing development, would that be a good way of putting it, Todd? No, absolutely. Yeah. Growing development for quite some time now, uh, crowdfunded like everything else that you guys have done. Uh, the Librem five has come an awful long way. We talked about that four months ago. Uh, I wanted to have you back on, uh, I was getting ready to reach out to you anyway, to talk about that when I saw this awesome thing. And I thought, Oh man, well, then I definitely need to reach out to Todd and let's talk about this. So, um, so let's talk, Todd, tell me, um, how would you describe your, your awesome SIM card plan to somebody who doesn't know from nothing about this? Uh, well, the easiest way to describe it is, um, the same way in which you may purchase a VPN for your computer. Uh, this is basically a VPN for your cellular provider. And so what that allows you to do is have uh, where you're buying the service on a monthly basis from Purism, and then we completely shroud any of the uh, uh, financial details behind that to the backbone provider. And so the backbone providers don't know anything uh, about the, uh, the uh, owner of the device, barring the, the three things that, of course, every carrier would know. Uh, such as uh, triangulation of the location of the phone, and then uh, phone calls that are made to you know from one number to another number, and then of course uh, SMS messages and the metadata behind that. But you actually don't have your financial details connected, so it's very similar to VPN in that way. A VPN is just uh, inserted in the middle to protect your privacy, and then you and the end. Uh, uh, website happens to uh, you know be able to communicate uh, via an encrypted channel in the middle. So when you and I, when people in our world talk and we use the phrase man in the middle, it's a bad thing. It's a bad thing because that normally refers to a type of attack where someone parks themselves in between device A and device B and intercepts the communications in between as they're passing back and forth. But this is a good version of man in the middle. So in a sense, you're you're purchasing a mobile phone plan from, and it looks like the two backbones that you uh, offer are T-Mobile and AT&T. So you, uh, your company, Purism, purchases that mobile phone plan and then sells me that SIM card so that I'm able to use that without my name, my credit card, my address, or anything else that can personally identify me being tied to that plan. Is that a good way of putting it? That's exactly right. So you're like, and, like a good man in the middle. Well, when you say man in the middle, of course, this, this is a similar thing you'd say to VPN. So it's, it's, this is encrypted data. 
So we do happen to charge right for the service and you can pay that via cryptocurrencies as well. But um, you, you also have a, usually people are paying for monthly subscriptions uh, based off of credit card. But what we're doing is we're holding that as the, as the provider. But because we have warrant canaries, we're a social purpose company, we have no tracking, we do not make any money off of data tracking. As a matter of fact, it would be uh, illegal for us to do so because in our articles of incorporation, we've stated we will never do so. So therefore, you can have this peace of mind that we are a privacy-based cellular VPN. And therefore, your all of your data, uh, it will be sent um, in this with no financial data attached to it. And that is really important. It's the same way in which you, people would sign up for VPN. This is just VPN for cellular. Awesome. So, you know, it's funny, you mentioned uh, warrant canaries in a previous episode. I, I talked some about that. I had a buddy of mine and we talked all about Linux. Um, and I don't remember if it made it onto the episode or if it was something I had to edit out just for time's sake, but, but he and I had a great conversation about warrant canaries and he wasn't familiar with the concept. Uh, and it's so for any listeners out there that either didn't hear that episode or maybe I didn't put that in the episode or you're going warrant canary. I don't even know what you guys are talking about. So back in the day, miners go, you know, a mile below the ground and, you know, some gases can build up down there that if you breathe them for more than a few seconds, you just haul off and die. So um, what they decided to start doing was, well, a bird like a canary breathes like, I don't know, a hundred thousand times a minute or something like that. I mean, they're just forever more inhaling and exhaling and they're smaller and they're much more sensitive to those things. So let's take a canary, put it in a cage. Uh, and if you, if you're on the PETA side of things, you might want to skip ahead for the next 45 seconds or whatever, cause this doesn't get pretty for the canary. Uh, the whole idea is that if we get down there and we're keeping an eye on the canary, singing his little head off in this dark hole while we're all mining away. And then all of a sudden he's not. And we look over and the canary's dead. We're all getting out of the mine. Why? Because gases are building up and we're not even sick yet, but I'm getting out of here before I die because the canary died. A warrant canary is so the FISA courts have, have said, and they're, you know, you can, I, I can send you uh, a document that tells me that tells you to tell me all about your users uh, and give me access to their information or maybe specific users or all users. And you're under a gag order. You can never tell anybody that I sent you such a document. And if you do tell anybody why I'll put you in, in a hole forever and ever and ever. Uh, and that's the end of you. But the Supreme Court has ruled and the, the well, maybe not. I, I don't know if the Supreme Court has ruled on this, Todd. You, you probably know more about that than I do. But I know federal courts have ruled that you cannot tell somebody that they cannot say that they have never been asked for such a thing. So a warrant canary as and the one on your website is, is very typical. It's, it's just a wonderful example of this. A warrant canary. So I go to your website and it'll say something like as of today's date and it'll list the date. Purism has not been issued any papers from any FISA courts, blah, 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 blah. Our next warrant canary will be issued on such and such a date. I look after that date and there's no warrant canary. You did not say that you've been reached out to by the NSA, but you're not saying you haven't been. And I need to know that. And there have been uh, instances in the past where uh, websites have uh, pulled the plug on a warrant canary and you just know like, okay, it's not safe to, to be here anymore. And I need to be careful about using these services or I need to look for an alternative or whatever else. So warrant canaries guys, it's a, it's just a way to play their game by their rules and still win. So uh, Todd, I was thrilled uh, to see that. And, and I wasn't surprised, but I was happy to see that you do do warrant canaries. I think that's great. You talked about triangulation. And so for the listeners, I just want to say, um, there, there are two ways that your mobile device knows where you are. Now, one way, just to be a mobile device, it kind of has to know where you are. It has to know which towers are nearest you uh, and that aren't too busy to route your call or else you would pull out your phone and you wouldn't be able to make a phone call because you've moved three miles since the last time you made a phone call and the phone doesn't know what tower to route that to. Or because the tower that's closest to you is too busy to take your call right now, you wouldn't be able to make or receive phone calls or send texts or emails or anything like that. So the phone has to kind of reach out to all the towers around it and using three or more of those towers, they can sort of pinpoint your location, but it's not accurate, accurate. 
The other way they do it is through GPS, which will get you down to, I think, three meters or something like that. Um, I mean, it'll, it'll tell not only what house you're in, but what room of the house you're in. Uh, triangulation, tower triangulation is not going to do that. There's no way around tower triangulation except, uh, Todd, the Librem 5, I can actually turn off the, the modem. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, so you actually have hardware kill switches. You have three of them on the Librem 5. So one of the hardware kill switches is for the cellular modem. And by toggling that, then what happens is it's actually a, a physical hardware kill switch, which means that you're severing power to it. So therefore, it has no communication to any cell towers whatsoever. The second hardware kill switch is for Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. So you can actually cut that one. And that, that by cutting both of those two, you sever all radio connections. And then the third one is for camera and microphone. Uh, on the device. If you happen to toggle all three of them off, we also uh, opt into what's called lockdown mode, which means it also disables all sensors, uh, including accelerometer and, a few, and a GPS and a few others. And so what you have is the ability to have this tight control. The other thing is, you know, so you can, you can see, you can toggle on your cell, your cell tower when you'd like to make a cell call or receive uh, cell calls. <clears throat> and then you have cell data as well. But if you're with connected with Wi-Fi, you have the ability to toggle off the cell tower uh, the cellular modem, and then you're able to just uh, utilize the Wi-Fi for uh, the things that you'd like, which also includes any type of uh, messaging that you're doing that uh, supports uh, internet messaging. So if you're talking about SMS or making a phone call, you're not able to do those things um, with unless a cellular connection is, is on, uh, but you're able to make internet phone calls or internet messaging uh, with the cellular tower off. So this allows you to have that fine grain control. Uh, and it's also this a, a really important part that I think is missing from what I'm stating when I'm describing three areas that the, that the cellular providers happen to know. You have to compare that to the hundreds of thousands of data points that are shared from anything that's on Android or iOS or on any other phone besides the Librem 5. The reason is because the, the cellular modem is attached to the CPU and memory, which means that those cell providers have root level access to everything on everybody's phone and therefore have millisecond accurate information from GPS, from your actual applications, to what your messages are. They're lower level than your encryption keys. They can update the firmware without your knowledge. So you, they, your device is completely owned by those cellular providers because they of the way the firmware is uh, supported uh, by the uh, those cell providers. So in our case, uh, they're dumb pipes. They happen to know three three bits of information that you have complete control over. And if you decided to um, do what we call as actually a no carrier phone, this is where you can actually have a phone that has no carrier and you don't even need uh, the Librem Awesome service or you don't and, and you can just have this be a, a Wi-Fi only device. And you then you make all your phone calls and messaging over Internet protocols like XMPP or or SIP, et cetera. Right. And so there's a number of those ways to do that. But so what we're after with Purism as an overall model is really simple. It's that we're driving for convenient products that can compete against big tech. And what we're so what we have is we have a phone that doesn't play any of the games of complexity of, of surveillance. Uh, and instead, we just sell hardware that we utilize the money we make from hardware to write a completely different operating system than Android or iOS that runs on our phone that allows you to have complete privacy and complete control. That means that there isn't vendor lock-in. There's no, uh, there's, you know, what you get from Apple or from Google is that they lock you in, you're renting the phone and they exploit, exploit your data every millisecond of every day. It is the anti-liberty devices. Ours is entirely about user freedoms and making sure that there isn't anybody who has control over your digital life. And that's, this is the only phone that's going to be able to do that. And somehow by attaching the word smart to the beginning of it, that made it all okay. It's a smartphone. Um, I think we're going to have to challenge the definition of that word. Um, so so one thing that's really cool, Todd, uh, about your phone. Um, now, your phone is a, a good bit thicker than people have gotten used to phones because phones, there's been this race to the dime, so to speak, to see, you know, can I get a phone that's thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner but your phone, because all of these elements uh, inside the phone, the modem, the baseband, the motherboard, all of these are separate items and more modular, uh, your phone's a little thicker. But again, that is because 
you chose to take the path of liberty for your users uh, and and do the phone in such a way that each of these pieces is a almost a standalone item. Is that correct? That's correct. It's all modular, um, and but we're talking about fourteen uh, millimeters, right? So it's not exactly uh, you know unbelievably thick. If you have any common phones now, and you add a you add an Otter box to it, it's going to be thicker than the Librem Five phone is. So right. uh, the the Librem Five phone at at fourteen millimeters is is certainly thicker than the uh, than the uh, non cased uh, existing phones, uh, but that's okay by us. And the reason is pretty simple is that to have proper security, we have to separate the baseband modem, the cellular modem, uh, from the main CPU and memory. To do that, we also need to then have, because we're talking about a CPU that's not in any mobile phones, these are quad core CPUs, these are in computers and they're in cars. And so the quad core CPU that we use is one that we also wanna have a large enough battery to be able to support long battery life. So. But, uh, so settling in to say we need to have security first, privacy first, modular approach where we're gonna we're going to disrupt the carriers and big tech. The uh, the first version we're putting out, the Librem Five V One, which is uh, uh, which is what we're putting out right now, is uh, is fourteen millimeter. Later on, we may be able to shrink that a little bit, but it's not it's not you know uh, so unbearably thick that it is awkward, right? It's it is just a fourteen millimeter thick. Uh, a 5.7 inch uh, black slate phone. Right. Um, so, you know, I, I was trying to do a quick search and, and see like how thick is the average phone? Cause you say 14 millimeters. I mean, that, that doesn't seem big to me. You know, when I look at pictures of it, it doesn't seem overly thick. It's, you know, I mean, I have heard uh, people say it, it's ca- kind of a thick phone, but I, I don't know that it wouldn't bother me. I mean, I, I've looked at the phone. I can't wait to get my hands on one. Um, and see just, you know, exactly, you know, how, how, but it looks like, it just looks like you'd, you'd feel it in your hand, you know, like, like, sure. you so, know so you're the, holding yeah, the, something. Comparison, the comparison, if we're talking about trying to, um, this is where I, what I call, you know, people always want you farther than where you are. So when we say it's a 14 millimeter phone, someone says, well, I want it to be 10. You say, okay, that's fine. You know, ours happened to be 14. If it's in your pocket, if it's in your purse, it fits in your car, it fits on your table, it, right. There isn't, it isn't like it, it, it it's this isn't a bag phone, right? So, right. Right. so, so this is where, um, yes, we recognize, uh, we acknowledge that it is uh, 14 millimeter, and uh, and that is where we are. The ability to do things in the future uh, does include being able to shrink the form factor size, shrink the thickness. There's, you know, as we're able to make significant improvements in kernel. Uh, battery draw, then we can also see that we don't need, you know, the because we have a very large battery, 4,600 uh, milliamp hour battery. We're able to then potentially shrink that battery and then also, uh, you know, shrink the overall phone size. So the same way that you saw, you know, the evolution of a lot of these smartphones was that they didn't start out anorexic, right? They started out where they were able to have the things that they needed in there and large battery life. As you're able to optimize the operating system, then you can start to trade that trade that out. Start removing battery life or battery size in favor of thinner devices and other versions. But we also this is again where it's really important uh, describing the facts uh, at the time that they are allows people to make an informed decision. And so if somebody wants uh, the Librem Five to be in a nine millimeter uh, chassis, well, you're not going to be getting the Librem Five version one. Exactly. So hold off and wait for the phone you want and continue in the meantime to use a phone that um, maybe has the form factor you want, but does not have the privacy standards that are important to you. And to me, I mean, I'll just tell you, Todd, the privacy is um, way, way more important to me. I mean, I remember um, reading years ago about Richard Stallman and the laptop he was using at the time. It was like a this was years ago and this was like, he was using like a 15 year old laptop or whatever, because he could do what he wanted to with it to tweak the privacy side of things and get it to do what he wanted it to do. Hey, if that's important to me and it's not important to you, then, you know, I understand. Uh, but just, uh, just know an informed decision you're sacrificing privacy over, you know, maybe I wanted a, a computer with white keys and you don't offer one with white keys. So I bought this, this other device or, you know, I wanted a laptop that had a 1080p screen and you only offer 720p. 
Uh, well, those if that if that's more important to you than Liberty, then you know get the other device. Uh, if you need a phone that is less than 14 millimeters thick, they, they make lots of those. They're just not going to value your privacy, right, Todd? Yeah, yes, that's correct. And, and then the the important part here is um, that those who want something in the future can also just support our cause by uh, by either donating, funding your application that you require to have on the phone. These are you know these are services. And, and even campaigns that we run, because overall, what we're trying to do is create a future that has a convenient alternative to the surveillance of big tech companies. Absolutely. So before we move much deeper into the phone, I want to back up just a little bit. Um, so your Librem, I'm sorry, Awesome plan uh, offers basically a, just an extra layer of privacy between me and my mobile provider. Um, and it's designed to work hand in hand with the Librem five, but I could order, uh, or could I, Todd, could I just go to your website right now and get one of those cards and, and put it into my, my device? So you can, and actually it's been kind of a surprising, uh, uptick in people asking for that Our original intention was really to say, you know, that this is something that is just about convenience with the Librem five, the people who want to order Librem five, and then a certain percentage of those are going to say, well, Hey, can you just give me the service as well? And we can do that. And we add this privacy layer. So it's really these, it is those two points, convenience and complete privacy. So, but, but we've had a number of requests, which is now we're, we're, uh, we're, uh, shifting the, it needs to be paired to an order to just saying, well, let's actually, uh, uh just ship the SIM cards. Uh, to the customers who would like that. So it, we haven't launched that as a, as a, an offering within Librem Awesome. However, we've had enough requests for it that uh, we're, we're likely to do that, you know, within, uh, before, before the end of the year. Okay. Glad to hear that. Um, so now the next thing would be um, T-Mobile and AT&T are the, the backbones that you use. I mean, I, I currently use a service provider that also uses T-Mobile. i don't go anywhere where I can't make a phone call. Um, we were way up in the, in the mountains uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, some friends did a big, uh, a big barbecue thing at their, at their house way out in the country. I was able to make a phone call. I was able to receive phone calls. I had data, uh, not a problem. at and I, I don't think anyone's going to run into great big dark spots where they're not going to be able to get that service. Um, your price, uh, I think it's $99 a month and it's prepay. So there's no contract, n none of that stuff. Uh, sure. I check out your, your thing for 99 bucks. I decide, eh, it's underwhelming and I don't want this anymore. Or for whatever reason, uh, I can discontinue that at any time, or I decide I like it and I just continue to prepay every month. And frankly, I, I'll say this to my listeners, folks, I, I think prepay is the way to go. I have, I have done prepay for years now. I refuse to be locked into a contract because if my service provider aggravates me, I want to be able to drop them without having to stop and think about it. Or I at least want to be able to tell them, Hey, here's what you're doing that's aggravating me. And I need you to either stop it or fix it, or I will find another carrier. And I've had to say that to my carrier twice in the five years that I've been with them Twice I've had to say, you know, you're not the only carrier and I'm not in a contract, right? So I need you to fix this. And they go, oh, ticky tick, it's fixed because they know that I can go somewhere else. And I like the freedom of being able to do that. So I was really, really stoked, Todd, to see that this is a prepaid plan because I think that's the best way to go. Um, customer service. What? Uh, so let's say I have... Uh, a problem. Um, I just, for whatever reason, am not able to make a phone call or my, uh, my voicemail messages aren't coming in like they're supposed to, uh, how is customer service handled for this, Todd? So it, we're what's, we would be what's called a skinny MVNO. So that is where you, you do contact us for customer service. And so, uh, that is, uh, the service is actually provided by either AT&T or T-Mobile, but we are the first line of defense for um, for billing, for service, for integration with the Librem 5. So what you can see by having that uh, that account with us is then you're able to reach out to us and say, hey, look at I have X, Y, or Z uh, issue. And then we are the ones who are um, working through that to uh, to resolve it. Awesome. I have to say the first thing I thought when I saw this, Todd, was um, that you are constantly, your company is constantly innovating and entering not a whole new arena, right? It's still computing and now mobile service, 
uh, it, it's it's within the realm of of things that are done with screens and and buttons. Okay, but you're constantly innovating and entering into whole new areas of that. And this just seemed like a really natural progression of your business model to say, look at if you're going to buy a phone anyway, you may as well buy one that offers privacy uh, and freedom. And if you're going to buy a phone that offers privacy and freedom, then here is an extra layer that we will offer to you. Uh, so if I want to order your phone and not get this plan, that's an option. If I yeah, want to absolute. order your phone with this plan, that's an option. And you're saying by sure. the end of the year, I could even be able to say, look, I'm not ready to buy your phone yet, but I want this plan. And it's, right. it's $99 yep. a month. And, you know, okay, frankly, I could do it for less. I could go and, you know, pick up, I could pay cash somewhere at a convenience store for a SIM card and pop that into my yep. phone. And I'd have, oh, some, some percentage. I'd be approaching the level of privacy that you offer. Maybe not 100% of that, but I'd be approaching that. But gosh, it'd be awfully inconvenient to have to go to some dodgy convenience store 12 times a year to, to, to buy a new SIM card or, or, you know, balance up my existing SIM card because I don't want to tie my credit card number to it. And the first time I decide I don't want to do that anymore and I'm just going to call them and give them my credit card number, I've completely uh, killed the privacy layer that I had had there because now I've tied my credit card under my name, my billing information, my address, all of that to my SIM card. So, right. and so it, what you're yeah, offered, oh, go ahead. It's it, well, you're, you're, you're touching on convenience, which is obviously what we're all about. So the aspect of convenience is that, uh, that what you just described is complicated. Certain people will do it. And, and that's great. There's nothing wrong with being able to pop in a prepaid SIM card and drop in going, you know, uh, every month before your, your, uh, your service ends and re up it right via cash. Uh, this is just for the, all the other people right, who are like, the normal I, don't want people. <laughs> I don't want to deal with that. I just would like to pay, but have all the privacy. And that's, that's what we offer. And so it's, um, it's something that, uh, as you're talking about this natural progression, this is an important part of our overall business model is that we, we sell hardware, right? With enough margin that we can fund the software for a lifetime. So you get no bloatware, no tracking, right? These are fundamental, uh, philosophies of our company. And then by, and then we also offer services. So you see it's hardware, software, and services. And the, and Librem Awesome is one of those services. Additional services that get bundled in, um, that are available are, uh, email, VPN, social media, right? On these, on decentralized privacy focused, uh, services. And the goal behind that is the more we can spread this, uh, these really ethical services, then the better society is going to be that does not preclude you from still signing up and messaging via Facebook messenger or, you know, or viewing people's Instagram or, or sending a tweet. Those things are, are completely uh, allowed because you're in control of the device and you can choose to do what you'd like to with it. But what we do is we set you up with, with sane defaults where you're completely protected and we do not exploit you in any way. That is an important peace of mind. So what you're doing at that point is you're like, I, my foundation's strong. I own my home. And now I'm inviting in the things that I would like to invite in, like logging into Facebook. But you also do that in isolation. So Facebook does not know your GPS data when you log in on a Librem 5. They do know your GPS data by just simply being pre-installed on Android or iOS. And so this is a level of complete protection that you get with the phone. And when you bundle that with Libra Mossum, then you're in the best possible privacy protection scenario that you also find to be very convenient. Man, I, I got to tell you, I'm excited about this. I'm very, very excited. And I'm hoping in the, in the very near future. So I'll go ahead and, and just put this out on the show here. It's a hard ask and uh, you can say no, but you'll look like a jerk, Todd. Uh, at some point, I'm going to get you to send me one of these devices for me to review uh, if that's oh, something, for sure. I, if, if I can talk you into that, I'll twist your arm real hard if I have to. No, we, we will obviously sending, be sending devices to reviewers. And I'm, you, I'm excited you about that. Oh, appreciate that. So um, let's talk about uh, the sort of where we are on the Librem 5. Because when I had you on four months ago, um, the Librem 5 was not mass production. Uh, it was more... Um, 
I think these were, it was all pre-order and, and we talked about sort of how your model was uh, same thing you did with your laptops back in the day. Uh, you know, you would build to order pretty much. Uh, and now, uh, if I just go on your website and order a laptop three or four days later, I could be smashing buttons on one of your laptops. Uh, mm -hmm. and it's as good as, as it's going to be at this moment. Uh, but I see that you're constantly innovating, even in the laptops, you've moved your 14 inch to a 13 inch, uh, been able to get that same size screen, uh, into a, I'm sorry, the 13 inch to a 14 inch. Let me, let me get it right now. You've been able to get mm -hmm. that, uh, a larger screen into that same size, uh, body, uh, form factor of a laptop. And I got to tell you, it's pretty exciting. And I've been watching the development with the Librem five. Where are we on that right now, Todd? Uh, so you're, you're correct in all those points. So earlier we had what was called pre-mass production. These are production uh, samples or uh, uh, engineering samples. And so we're able to do small batches that we could get to some of these early backers who were you know, very interested in sort of paying attention to where we are in the hardware development process. Hardware development is hard. So it takes time. We're doing it, uh, you know, from the scratch, right? This is all schematics on up in-house with Purism. So to produce the phone, uh, we wanted to make sure that we're able to get to mass production, which is where we are right now. The the uh, of course, depending on when your show airs, um, we're going to be uh, making an announcement of um, the beginning shipping of the Libra Five mass production within the course of the next week or a week and a half. So that is the final production of the of the Librem 5. So this, what we're talking about there is uh, production quality, right? There's, there's not, the, the, the tolerances are all dialed in. We're talking about being able to produce a gigantic quantity of these devices. We've paid for all of the, what's called tooling that allows us to produce in giant quantity. So the quality of the hardware is, is finalized. Uh, we've also been able to, through the PCBA, this is a printed circuit board assembly, we're able to, uh, make the minor tweaks that we've been able to uh, through these earlier versions. So we have a final version of the PCBA that we're able to put in these phones where we have it be uh, very stable. And so overall, what you're looking at is uh, being able to have the first version of the Librem 5 hitting mass market within the course of the next uh, couple of weeks. Awesome. The software side, the software side of it is where uh, we're able to have uh, continuous integration, which means we're, we're ever improving this. And this is an important distinction to make here because every purchase of the Librem 5 phone funds the development needed to create an operating system that actually is competing against Android or iOS. These are not Android and they are not iOS phones, obviously. And so by being not Android, uh, then that is a massive investment. We've invested millions of dollars to create the uh, pure OS operating system that goes on the mobile phone. So what why that's important is that when people are purchasing our hardware, we reinvest it to, so that we can continue to advance uh, making privacy protection and secure devices the forefront and making it where you have this convenient alternative. So every dollar purchase means that you're backing this overall movement that you actually would like to see a future where you control your digital life. So the operating system, when we were talking four months ago, uh, we've made we've made a laundry list of improvements that are significant. And, and this is another important part. When you have hardware, as our hardware in the Librem 5 is brand new CPU, this is a quad core computer. What that means is that we're able to uh, take the entire desktop operating system and put it on a mobile device, which means that we have what's called greenfield improvements that we were able to make. What that means is that we can make a single tweak to a kernel and get an additional four hours of battery life, which we've done. You, we can also, uh, which is gonna be upcoming because it's not available right now, is dropping certain parts to idle. And what we'll be able to do at that point is go from around nine hours or 10 hours of runtime right now to over 24 hours uh, because uh, because we're able to optimize things very through, through not a lot of code um, because there's so much greenfield for improvement. And so then you can start to see that after many, many months of this process, then you'll start to dial in the mass production uh, hardware that's, that's capable of doing all of these things uh, and have the software catch up to that. One example case uh, as it relates to the application level, uh, we have a front-facing and rear-facing camera 
but the the kernel driver needed to drive that camera is in its rudimentary state that we've written. And so we're going to be initially shipping the phones without a kernel application or without, excuse me, with a camera application. And so, uh, the, and that will come in a software update, you know, in the course of maybe an additional month or two. And then you'll have full, fully functioning front facing and rear facing camera. And every order after that, we'll see this additional improvement. So when you're talking about, uh, uh, we're not just putting out hardware, right? We are putting out the bundle of hardware, software, and services, because at the end of the day, the only way to compete against big tech is to create convenient products that, that actually protect people's digital lives. So the beauty of being a greedy capitalist pig is that you do make a profit and then you reinvest that profit into improving your product so that you can make a profit so that you can reinvest that profit into making your product better and better. Yes, correct. We did not incorporate as a social, as a uh, nonprofit. Well, we, we did incorporate as a social purpose company and that is an important distinction. So we are uh, very much profit uh, about profit so we can reinvest that and improve the product. Uh, but we're a social purpose company and the SPC status, the reason that's so important is that we can challenge big tech's surveillance uh, as a business model because they maximize shareholder value at the expense of users' data. And we didn't want to do that. So we enshrined in our articles of incorporation to say we're not going to do that, but we clearly are still uh, a for-profit company because we need to uh, be able to compete against head-to-head -head with those organizations and those, those big tech companies. The, the distinction you're, you're highlighting is it's an important one. Having a business model that has profit allows us to, re to invest and continue to make these improvements so that we're around next year, the year after that, and we can continue to provide the service that is uh, so important to all of our users. Yeah, so you and I talked about this last time, um, that your, your articles of incorporation actually create a legal obligation for you to live up to your social purpose, which in this case is protecting privacy of your users, the privacy and liberty of your users. Correct. And that you have to place that even above profits, but that doesn't mean that you're not trying to make a profit. So I don't know, maybe, maybe a lot of my listeners are just a better person than I am, Todd, but there's this radio station that plays in the back of my head all day long, every day. It's W I I F M. It stands for what's in it for me. Uh, you know, I, I do, I think about me and what I want and what's important to me. Now, most of that, just so you guys don't think I'm a complete dog relates to my family and my faith and things that actually are really important. Not just like me want, you know, it's, I, I'm not the Hulk and I'm not a, a Neanderthal about it, but you know, part of it is that, you know, there are certain apps that I use. Uh, I, I am currently an Android user. Um, I plan to get this phone and then I won't be an Android user anymore. Uh, and my, my time with Android, by the way, guys dates all the way back. My first Android phone was the Motorola click spelled C L I Q do a search of it, have a good laugh at, at the phone. I was so excited about when I got it. Uh, it was Android 1.5, uh, which was, um, what is that? Was that cupcake? Yeah. Android 1.5 cupcake. Uh, it didn't even have multi-touch on the screen. You double tapped to make a picture bigger. And if you double tapped again, it got smaller again. You couldn't pinch to enlarge. You, there was no multi-touch. It was, <laughs> and I was stoked about it. Right. But all of that to say that I throw money at app developers all the time because there's an app that I like and I'll, you know, they have a donate button. I'll throw them five bucks or whatever. Now, am I doing that because I'm this altruistic guy who's like, Oh, I bet it'll really help that fellow. No. No, I like his app. I like the code he writes. I like the stuff he produces, and I want it to be worth his while to continue producing it. So we support the things that are important to us, whether we realize that or not. Uh, and if we don't support those things that are important to us, we look around one day and realize, oh, this app hasn't been updated in a year because that guy quit. He went and did something else. He gave up on this app because no one was supporting it. Or he doesn't even develop apps at all anymore. He's gone and gotten a job with some corporation writing code for them where he can actually get paid doing it. Because it's a sad fact, folks, but money makes the world go round. That's just a reality. Um, so you talked some about battery life. Uh, Todd, would you would you say that the average user right now, you're going to, first, let me back up. Have you 
is this the first time in any forum at all that you've announced uh, that within the next couple of weeks you'll be going mass production? Uh, it is. Um, Heard because, it here first, uh, folks. Because, you're t- because the timing of this interview. Uh, so I scooped it, everybody. Be, <laughs> it's kind of it's it's kind of humorous that that ends up being true. I, I believe t- tonight at midnight, then uh, then those customers that are getting the uh, the first uh, week's worth of shipments are going to be getting their email. Uh, so I need to hurry and, and get this out. <laughs> <laughs> because yeah they'll, they'll be starting to talk about it and i think our press release that goes out uh will go out under embargo at the end of this week and then probably uh you know hitting the the uh, embargo lifted on uh on uh tuesday but it's obviously going to have an awful lot more detail than than we're beginning to ship do i need to sit on this for a couple of days todd uh, well, because you're only talking about beginning to ship and not any of the other details um, that that we, we've sort of hinted at that uh, from our website, you know, meaning we published a frequently asked questions sort of like, you know, right. So uh, so it's not something that I think uh, is uh, I didn't tell you anything that's in the press release or under embargo. So you're OK. You're awesome. all right. Awesome. Ha ha. Got my scoop. OK, so um, would you say that the guy who orders this right now, it's going into mass production two weeks from now, somebody orders this phone. A few days later, they're holding it in their hand. Is it a daily driver no. for that guy? Well, let's first back up to, we have a very, very long line. Okay. Of we have now a that's huge true. Amount of you've got a backlog you're going to have to work through. So, And, and operationally speaking, right, uh, there's there's no way to satisfy that that demand. Uh, so we're it's talking a good about problem a to have. Months. No, no, it absolutely, it absolutely is. But we also, I want to make sure we're level setting expectation here. Placing an order, we're talking right now, you'd be looking at a few months from now and you'd be uh, you'd be able to have the Librem 5. Now, there's there is there is a separate uh, SKU, Librem 5 USA. Now, that one is because that wasn't part of our campaign, but that's made in the USA electronics for a phone. By the way, that is revolutionary. OK, we're talking oh, about no doubt. Things. You know, I don't think we mentioned that at all in any of the past uh, times I've had you on here. Uh, it's epic, right? So a Librem Key is an example is made in USA. It's made in our factory, uh, made in USA uh, d- uh, product. The Librem 5, U- Librem 5 USA is all the electronics that go into the phone are produced in the United States, which, of course, means um, uh, the ultimate uh, secure uh, supply chain. Right. So that device now it, it is, of course, more expensive. This is a two thousand dollar phone versus an eight hundred dollar phone. But you're getting a secure supply chain. And that line is a lot shorter because we did not run a crowdfunding for that. We just announced it that we're going to be producing it. So as an example of be- being able to buy a Librem 5 USA, if you place that order now, you could be getting that in, in uh, you know, in January. So for if a you place mere $1,200 extra, you can jump the line. <laughs> yes, exactly. And, right. and, and get a phone system. that's made in the USA, lock, stock, that's and right. barrel. That's right. And it's pretty, it's that, that is, uh, you know, the and five USA has, it does have a, a, a smaller market in the B2C space, but the significant market for Libra and five USA secure supply chain is B to B and B to G. Those, those are where. Okay. Where talk to me like I'm five, Todd. High. I don't know what you're saying. <laughs> so that is, uh, you know, B2C is consumer, right? B to B is enterprise. Okay. Right. Business. And business B2G is business. Got it. Got it. Okay. So governments clearly uh, want to have a secure supply chain and know that it's U.S. manufactured by uh, U.S. owners, as an example. Right. And so that is um, that's because, I mean, it's- you know, I'm going to pull out the snark machine for a second here. It's not like we would want government entities using, oh, I don't know, firewalls that had, I don't know, Chinese malware in them or anything like that. <laughs> Yeah, and the and the nation state piece is is very significant when you're talking about government levels, right? So, so this is where the demand from the the governments, and this isn't just U.S. government. We're talking about any government being able to actually control the supply chain is really important, and being able to certify the supply chain is really important. So that's where Libra and Five USA comes. But it's really also pretty fun to be able to expand our the growth of our company by doing made in USA uh, electronics. Uh, no and it, that's an ever growing area that we're uh, that we're uh, focusing on. So to answer your question, which was uh, if a person bought something, a Librem 5 phone right now, uh, the first piece is when they would get it, which I've addressed. The second piece is would that uh, be their daily driver? So let me address that part, because setting expectation is very important when you're talking about a different operating system than the than Android or iOS. 
initially our campaign that we ran about this building the product, we talked about five applications, being able to make phone calls, which absolutely works on the Libra 5 and has for many, many months. The being able to send text messages, SMS messages, which does work and has for many, many, many months. The ability to browse the web, uh, that we actually have two browsers that are supported, the, in, the included browser, plus we also support uh, Firefox, which is a, a very good uh, universal browser that, that uh, can address a number of other issues beyond the default browser we have installed. So those are the key things that you even brought up in your example case. Then we, and by having a browser that that is uh, that works for all these use cases means that yes you can go log into Uber and book a rideshare or Lyft and book a rideshare. You can also log into Facebook and you can log into Instagram and you can log into Twitter and you can actually create these isolated applications. Even you can you can actually have them be an icon on the desktop of the device. But um, uh, but by having it be isolation means that they don't have any other access than the information you actually share with the website. And that's an important distinction from Android or iOS. So, but if your requirement is you have, uh, you want 35 applications and those thir and 20 of them are not yet available or not available through the browser, let's say like games or something, then we offer a fund your app campaign. So you can come to our website and you can say, hey, I'd like to see this application and you can certainly develop a, a fund the development of that. And then we, and, and for us, it's a knowing where you are while you're advancing on a very rapid rate uh, to where you'd like to be. So the aspect of, is it gonna be a daily driver? It is for me. It is for a bunch of people who have early release phones. It will be for those who understand that this is what you get with the product. This is also why we offer Libram Awesome is that you can actually have a separate phone number that you can uh, begin to transition to on the Libram 5 and hope that it can become a daily driver. Right. And then what you're looking at is you're looking at what use cases do you have that it doesn't get support and then you can fund that development and we'll be happy to uh, uh, prioritize the, those applications that are needed. And we're gonna see more and more applications being uh, grow, growing because the more product we ship, some of the early backers are clearly developers. Those developers create more applications and you have this positive feedback loop where we actually can compete on the application level. The other important part about the business model side of it uh, is the B2C market, the consumer market. The, the conversation is always around the number of applications, right? It's battery life, number of applications, and that's pretty much the two main topics. In the B2B or business market, enterprise market, uh, they only want two or three apps and we can support those. Well, uh, the B2G well, so only want two or three apps and we can support those as well. So it becomes where we have a business model that can grow in these really significant areas and the, the money coming in from enterprise and government also has this positive feedback loop on being able to create and invest in the B2C market, the consumer market. Well, you know, and it's not unlike, uh, when iPhone first came out or, you know, going back to my, my story earlier about my very first Android, um, every app in the world was not available for Android. When I adopted Android, I was not an, I guess I was an early adopter. I mean, not, not like some, but you know, I had, there, there weren't more than a handful of Android phones out. Uh, when I adopted Android, I just finally got sick to death of Blackberry. Yeah, folks. I said, Blackberry, <laughs> Ask your grandparents about BlackBerry. Um, so I, I switched to Android and, you know, right about that time, I had some friends that were switching to, to iPhone. And uh, I mean, there were a lot of things that just weren't available and you just did it in the browser and it didn't slow you down. It didn't hurt your life. Your cat didn't die because of it. It was fine. Uh, and so it yeah, seems so that, that's it. the same thing that Apple did in the early days, which, which they did not have an app store and everything was through the browser. As a matter of fact, that was the original uh, model that was even presented. And so, so we, we adopted that same type of thing, which is to say, yes, we're going to have core applications. The applications are going to continue to grow every month, but you can do everything well, near everything that you'd like to do through the browser. And because you can create, you can go to a, uh, any website and you can create the website as an, as a local app. So right. it can actually sit there as an application. And if you, so if you want some of these, uh, applications, let's say like save to uh, desktop. You know, 
Yeah, exactly. And right. so then what you get is it's actually create local web app. And then you have this local web app that sits as an icon. And you're actually none the wiser that the code isn't actually running locally. Right. And so that gets us to where we can really have this really solid bridge between uh, what we're delivering, what the expectation is, and and also being able to satisfy it being a daily driver. There's one other extra point here that's really important to make is that you also can run what's called Anbox, which means you can run Android in an emulator to get any additional Android applications that are needed, because again, this is a quad core computer that's in your pocket. So you can run a full blown uh, Android emulated on the device to get uh, these additional applications if you require to, to do so. So if there's a particular Android app that I just need for whatever reason, let's say I it's a banking app that's not available yet or uh, you know, something that's important to me for whatever reason, it's just a game and I'm not going to live without that particular game. I'm, I'm going to play word brain, darn it. Uh, then I can emulate that in Anbox uh, and just fire up an Android emulator and fire up that game and play the game to my heart's content. That's right. And so the, the ability to address the number of applications question, and this, this does relate to daily driver aspect of things, right? Is, is everybody has a number of applications they want. Some of these use cases we already satisfy and they're daily drivers for those people. There's other ones where it might not be a daily driver yet, but by supporting the cause, you're able to get the device and even have a, let's say, Librem Awesome service where you're just like, this is going to be my privacy phone for now. And then I have my Android phone that I use for other purposes as I'm transitioning over. And then every couple of days when a new software release uh, happens on our phones, because we're under a very rapid release right now, then you're able to follow along and see what applications are available and upgrade. And then at some point, in the, I wake up not, one morning and I go, future. hey, I don't need my Android phone wake. anymore. Exactly. And so that allows you to have this transition while you're also supporting the overall movement to actually compete and have a have a convenient alternative to uh, to the big tech companies. That sounds like a wonderful plan. So um, as it stands right now, I could load um, there. There are some Linux things that I would just be able to do on this because this is straight up Linux. So I am a Proton VPN user. I could just through Open VPN, I could just install Proton VPN in much, if not exactly the same way as I've got it installed on my laptop, and I would be exactly. VPNing all of my traffic. Or I could use your service that you offer, which I think you call um, Librem Tunnel. Yes, correct. Yeah, but the, the answer is yes. You you can. So this is this is one of the powerful things, and 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 if we have time, we can touch on convergence. So I this was going is, there uh, next. Okay, so this is a, a, a an important thing to note is the Librem Five phone is a mini desktop computer. It's a server. It's a laptop because you have complete control. So the things that you're familiar with, if you have a Linux kernel-based distribution right now, then you can do all of those things on your phone. You have complete control. So yes, you can load up a, a, a different VPN provider into the settings and you have a VPN through them. Uh, you have root level access. You can install a web server and you can serve content to your local uh, Wi-Fi spot. You can uh, have it stream video content to your, uh, your, to your TV. There's all of these capabilities because you have complete control of the device. And the convergence piece to get ahead of your question is thanks for the, that. Yeah. Is where you can take a, the Librem five, plug it in to a monitor, keyboard or mouse or your television or a projector, and it is a full-blown computer. So the same way in which you buy a tower PC and you plug it into a keyboard, mouse, and monitor, and you operate it as a desktop computer, the Librem 5, you can remove the tower PC and plug in a Librem 5, and you have the exact same experience. You have a full-blown desktop computer first that also happens to be a phone, which means that the tens of thousands of desktop applications that are in pure OS or any other Linux kernel based distribution is just, it just works. So therefore you have a, a massive array of very powerful productivity, high quality software 
that will work on that as a full-blown desktop computer. Then when you unplug it, you're able to use it as the phone, which has a, lim a much smaller amount of applications that we've been able to make adaptive to the small screen that you use with your fat finger. But the important part behind that is that new applications are actually only making them adaptive. You take the exact same code base and you use the libraries we published. So this is developer speak for a moment. The developers take the exact same code base they have on a desktop application. Let's say it's a video editing program and they can make that adaptive by using the libraries we've published to make it adaptive, which means it can work on a large screen desktop as it always has, or you can resize it to the size of a uh, mobile phone like the Librem 5 and do everything with your finger. So that means that that's true convergence. That is where you can plug it in and have a full blown quad core desktop computer. And I'm gonna, even though I'm describing these things, it is uh, uh, mind blowing when you actually do it because society has just generally accepted that phones are a separate thing. They're, they're a phone, they're a, that's, it's my phone operating system, it's my mobile operating system. And the fact of the matter is, that is a very powerful computer. And so what we did is we just said, it doesn't matter to us the form factor. You can be a server, you can be a mini PC like the Librem Mini, it can be a laptop like our Librem 14, or it can be the Librem 5 phone. All of it's running the same exact operating system. It just depends on the size of screen and your input device. So, here, so it's all the same code. So here's a day in the life. And you, you stop me, Todd, the moment I go wrong, okay? Day in the life. I sit down at my desk here. I've got two monitors. Uh, I've got a USB hub so that I can get everything connected. I plug my Librem 5 into my USB hub that goes out to a keyboard, a mouse, two monitors, and an external hard drive. And... I'm producing, I'm writing for the new American magazine. I'm handling all my social media stuff that I need to handle. I record a podcast. I, I pop that, that card over into something that will allow that large card that I've got to be read by the Librem five. I fire up audacity. I edit the podcast. I post the podcast in the middle of all of that. My sister calls. I'm wearing a Bluetooth headset, so I just reach up and hit the button. And while I'm working, I'm talking to her on the same phone that I'm doing all of that on. I get done. My workday is over. I unplug my phone. I walk in the house and I treat my phone as if it were a media server because I've got some movies and what have you stored on there that I've, however, I've acquired those folks. Okay. We're not going to talk about how I acquired those movies. They just happen to be on my device and I send those over to the larger screen in my house and I sit down with my wife while I drink an adult beverage and we watch an episode of whatever or we watch whatever movie. And then I walk out and go to the store and while I'm at the store, my wife calls me and I take a phone call and I send her a text and I can send her a picture of, hey, they really are out of the almond milk you wanted so that I have plausible deniability. And all of this is being done from one device. Uh, every part of that story is accurate with one exception okay. is that currently uh, the Librem 5 phone drives one monitor, okay. not two. Okay. Uh, everything else of what you described is spot on. And we're going to have more videos being posted showcasing that exact story uh, filmed by the actual usage of that. So we're, there's no, there's no like behind the scenes, uh, 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 trick tricks going on. You actually are real users hub, actually doing it. Yeah, that's right. And you're and you're able to you know edit 3D renders. Actually, you can edit the video. We actually did post a video that shows saw that uh, that was completely produced on the Librem Five. Saw the that. The other thing that's great about this is the um the from a software development standpoint, the the software developers can use this as their development machine. So they can actually develop applications on the device itself, as opposed to uh, what is typically done in mobile, where you're where you're programming it on a laptop or desktop, emulated to what actually renders on the phone, and then publishing it to the phone because those phone mobile OSs aren't aren't uh, set up to do so. This is one in which we have true convergence, and we're the innovators behind doing true convergence to where we're flipping the script. This is not a mobile OS any longer. This is a full-blown, completely powerful quad-core desktop computer that happens to also be a phone. So when you're looking at it from that standpoint, 
if somebody's tr talking about having it where they want all their data and you know easy access from all their devices, uh, the Librem 5 phone becomes the central hub of that. And it is where you can have complete control of your digital life on a very powerful desktop computer. And the desktop side of it has all of the applications that everybody who uses a, a, a Linux kernel-based distribution now are familiar with. And if you're not, all the things you're familiar with on a Windows or Mac system have an equivalent to where you can actually be uh, just as productive. And then you can see you can have a full-blown uh, uh, email client, video editing, photo editing, audio editing, web browser, all from the Librem 5 and a desktop mode. And then when you unplug it, it those applications that only run in desktop mode, the application, the app icons uh, hide, and you're only left with the applications that run on the mobile device, which are uh, obviously, as I stated earlier, uh, more limited because we need to make them all adaptive. And we're investing to make more and more of these applications adaptive, which you'll see uh, greatly increase over time. Man. Okay. So the only difference between my story and, and your correction of it is that I would just have to run this on say a 27 inch monitor where I can snap different things to different corners of the monitor. And then I still have all the functionality that I'm used to. Correct, man. Okay. Folks go back and listen to that part again. Uh, your phone becomes your one personal device. And if you want to maintain a laptop or a desktop computer, nobody's stopping you from doing that. But since it could also be a media server or any other kind of server, your files could actually live on this because the uh, it'll take a, a micro SD card uh, up to how big? I, oh boy, now I think they're over over 120. I think I, I think I just saw 256. Okay, 256 uh, gigabytes. Yeah, I've seen those. Okay, yeah. so you put a 256 gigabyte uh, uh, micro SD card in this thing and. You know, maybe you're not keeping every file you ever cared about. You know, it's not two terabytes, but uh, every Actually, I, I believe there's even a two terabyte uh, micro SD card now. Uh, so, All right. I got to catch yeah. up. I, I yeah. got to catch up. Well, that's the thing. By, by the time this publishes, you'll you'll see a four gig one, right? So, right. Yeah. There's so four so terabyte. everything that you yeah. want uh, is on this one device. And so you point your laptop to that on your network because you make it a shared folder and all of your files and folders, everything that you need is right there on your Librem five, anywhere you go, you travel out of town and you think, you know, I'm not even going to take my laptop with me because I'll be using at the Cleveland office. You know, they'll have a desktop for me. You just point that computer to this by making it part of the network. And there are all your files and folders. You go back to your hotel room, you, plug up to the monitor, the keyboard and the mouse, and you're off and running and you can watch blue bloods to your heart's content or whatever it is you want to do. I there's also this, um, this other piece that's really important to note there because, because beyond uh, true convergence that this is a device you actually have root level access to. So this is another piece that kind of is going to blow people's minds. And it's something they have to kind of wrap their head around by actually seeing it in use this way, but it is also can be a server. So you can stream content from this as you can have it be, have it be your web server and have it pop onto local Wi-Fi and have everybody connect up to that local web server. You can run all the server applications that you normally would have on cloud, you know, or VPN or VPSs or, uh, you know, on, uh, large servers. You can do them all from the local Librem 5 itself, which means that this opens up an entirely new world for being able to um, serve podcasts directly from the phone itself when you're, you know, uh, if, you'd, if you'd like to do so. Uh, download content behind the scenes. Um, you know, you can have it be your, uh, in, in your case, maybe your video download daemon that sits behind the scenes and, and downloads all these things through the course of the day. It can do all of those things because you have root level access and it is actually a full-blown desktop computer in a mobile form factor. So rather than taking the approach that the other guys took where they said, hey, we've got this, uh, you know, for instance, we've got Windows. Now we're going to make Windows mobile version or what do they call it? Compact edition. What do they call it? Windows, yeah, Windows CE, yeah. CE, compact edition. Yeah. So what you said was, I'm not going to build uh, an operating system for the phone that is its own operating system. 
it is the desktop version of the operating system. It's just configured for the size of this screen and the keyboard that pops up on the screen and all of those things that make it part of a phone, but it is the exact same operating system. That's correct. It's exactly the same operating system. So rather system. than trying to shrink an operating system down to the phone, you just put the full operating system on the phone. And when I plug it into a monitor, it expands to do everything that it's built to do in the first place. Correct. And you can drag from the screen on the mobile phone onto the larger screen that you have sitting there as your full-blown desktop. And then what you see is with, with that type of a, an approach to things, what, what, what you're able to do is the decades worth of productivity that's been put into the desktops, laptop space, all work already. And then what we've done is we've adapted the screen because you realize at the end of the day, what's the difference between a desktop computer and a laptop computer and a phone? It is just the output to, of a screen and the input device. Is it your finger or is it a keyboard, right? Is the keyboard attached? Is it Bluetooth, right? These are just inputs and outputs, but at the core of it all is just a computer. And so what we've done is we've taken the desktop operating system that's had decades of development on applications, but those applications have always been about a user interface that's from a full-blown keyboard, trackpad, mouse, and a full-size monitor, that that's how you're communicating with it. And what we did is we made them adaptive so each of those applications can then, when you shrink them down, they rearrange the buttons and make them larger because your input device goes from a keyboard and mouse to your finger or multi-touch. So you have multiple fingers. And so then you're able to uh, simply adapt it to just the different interface that you have coming in. And then the output, of course, is a smaller screen, 5.7 inch in our case, uh, that allows you to uh, render the, the content and these applications in that manner. So we wrote all of that, right? We wrote the shell, we wrote the compositor, we wrote the, the on-screen keyboard, the uh, feedback daemon to make it run on a mobile device. These are all things that when somebody's buying a, a phone from us, that we're able to invest it to make sure that we uh, have true convergence across all of our devices. And at the end of the day, somebody who's buying our laptop is gonna be directly familiar with how the phone works because it's the exact same operating system. So it really comes down to um, a very capitalist model uh, that uh, people looked at what you were doing. And I'm going way back, Todd, I'm going way back to when you said, I'm going to build a laptop that values your privacy. And you crowdsourced that or crowdfunded that. And people came in and said, look, I'll throw you $5. I'll throw you $50. I'll throw you $150. And you put together this money that you needed. And if I remember you, you met your goal, uh, you exceeded your goal uh, in way less time than you thought, uh, th than you had set to meet the goal. Is that correct? Yes. And in, in all of our campaigns and all of your, I, I knew that was the case. So, uh, and then you begin selling these laptops and you're making a profit. Like you say, you're, you're not a 501 C three. You're not in this, uh, you know, to lose money. Uh, but because you've been able to make a profit, then you said, okay, well, then we're also going to make this Librem key and we're also going to make this other laptop and we're also going to make this phone. And, you know, here's folks, if you're still listening and, and, you know, I know we've run a little bit long, but people, Todd, when I have you on, people love it when we run long, I, I, they just must like our dynamic together. Um, but do this, do this, consider this, this awesome plan, go to, uh, Puris, Puri .sm. I'll, I'll put a link in the note. It's kind of a weird web address. It's P-U-R-I dot S-M. Uh, if you go there and scroll down a little bit, you'll see this awesome plan, A-W-E-S-I-M. Uh, check it out. It's $99 a month. And for that, you get uh, unlimited uh, talk, text, and data, a phone number that's registered and operated under Purism that's not tied directly to you. And then to me, the big thing is, and I love this, Todd, you spell it out on the website, support the movement. You get to help fund additional development services offered from Purism. Folks, it is not unlike this podcast that is listener supported. I could have taken a model that says, I'm going to run ads. I'm going to pester you to death with ads. 
that have got nothing to do with nothing except that I'm being paid to, to hawk some product to you. You know, we could talk about the, you know, the Quip toothbrush, like all the other podcasts you're listening to right now, or Harry's razors or whatever else that, you know, you would wonder your whole life is Mitch really, does he care about this product and really think I should use it? Or is he just saying that because, uh, like a capitalist whore, he was told to say that and they threw him a few shekels and that's fine. That's one legitimate business model. I took a very different model and said, I'm going to be listener supported. And some of you have stepped up to the plate and I appreciate it supporting me on Patreon. I'm going to put links in the show notes for the rest of you that haven't done that yet and ask you to consider it. If you like what you hear on this podcast and you want me to be able to keep doing it, then support the show. If you like what purism is doing, support them, support the things you care about, because if you don't support them, you turn around one day and realize it's gone. And because it's gone, it's probably not coming back. Uh, so Todd, God bless you, brother. Thanks for being on the show again. I really just always love chatting with you and I'm super excited about what purism is doing. Uh, to, again, to the listeners, and if you're watching, if you're catching this on YouTube or on whatever, wherever you catch podcasts, uh, be sure to subscribe and go down to the show notes. Check the show notes in the bottom of this. There's going to be a link down there to Purism. Uh, check out this awesome plan. Uh, I know for myself, uh, the very next phone. I mean, I'm milking my phone for for everything it's worth right now to get the last few days or weeks or months of life out of it. It's an old one plus three. If that gives you an idea how long I hang on to a device. Um, but my very next phone is the Librem five. If it describing it the way you describe it right now in the videos I've seen, Todd, it's, it's ready for me as a daily driver. It's going to do everything I need it to do. And then some, and by supporting it, folks, we help move this project forward because as money flows in production flows out and uh, I can't wait to see where this phone is in five years. So Todd, thanks for being here, brother. Oh, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Hey, God bless. Stay safe and don't lick any doorknobs. Okay. <laughs> All right. Folks, I will catch you next time on Enemy of the Surveillance State. I promised last time, by the way, that we would talk about an update on what's going on in the war on encryption. But then I saw this awesome thing and thought that I would just interrupt that flow. I actually kind of thought that I might record this and sit on to it for a few, you know, sit on it for a few days, hang on to it and uh, go ahead and do that episode on encryption. But I'm not going to pass up the chance to get a scoop. I'm going to go ahead and get this published uh, right away. Uh, it is a. Uh, Tuesday, November 10th. I'm going to try to get it up tonight. If not, uh, you know, it'll probably be out Wednesday. You guys can kind of judge how long it took me to do that when you finally get around to listening to it. Uh, the next episode, I do intend to handle what's going on in the war on encryption. But I will say that this conversation that I'm having with Todd is part of what's going on in the war on encryption. Because, you know, I keep saying, I know everybody's all up in the air right now about the elections. Let's all just take a step backward and chill out for a second because privacy is not a partisan issue. Uh, we've been stepped on by the left. We've been stepped on by the right. We've been stepped on by guys that say they're middle of the road. This is not left versus right. This is privacy versus liberty. And I appreciate you being here to listen. So God bless you. Stay safe out there. Be sure to subscribe and share this with friends because friends don't let friends get spied on. I'll catch you next time on Enemy of the Surveillance State. <laughs>